From the Edge Media Studios in downtown Indianapolis, this is Indiana Issues. Here's your host, Abdul Hakeem Shabazz. Hello and welcome to Indiana Issues, the public affairs program. We'll go beyond the headlines and sound bites and bring you Indiana's newsmakers in their entirety. Well, 100 days until Election Day, the effects of COVID-19 and the passing of a former governor, all topics on our agenda for today. And our guests today include Democrat Laura Beck, Republican Cam Carter, a reporter for WIBC and Network Indiana, Eric Berman, and Libertarian Lindsey Marie. And so uh, we're going to go ahead and start with you, Eric. Uh, we got 100 days to go until the Election Day. Uh, let's start with the presidential race, Joe Biden and uh, Donald Trump. Uh, what, do you, what do you see? How's this all looking so far, my friend? Yeah, it's, it's increasingly looking like Joe Biden's race to lose. I mean, Var Vargas's law applies. It's a long way to the election. Um, as you said, it's st still 100 days, just under 100. A lot can change between now and then. We don't know where the virus is going to go. We don't know what's going to happen in the debates. But it's it's the most steady, large lead that we've seen in an election in 24 years. And that, that election was Bill Clinton and Bob Dole. And Bill Clinton basically never looked back. Um, you want to be in Joe Biden's position right now. Uh, Laura, let me get your thoughts. Uh, is this race Joe Biden's to lose, or can anything still happen within these 95-something-odd days? Well, I mean, anything can happen. Um, if 2020 has taught us anything, it's that anything can happen. Um, it's sometimes not what we want to happen. Um, but I, I do think, I, I do agree with Eric, I think that it is Joe Biden's to lose. Um, I am constantly flummoxed by uh, how Donald Trump is behaving throughout this election. Um, especially because uh, every single national article is is encouraging him and is sort of analyzing uh, why he just is not, why he's behaving as if he wants to lose. Um, so if there's a strategy there, I don't know what it is. Uh, but I think Biden is in a good position. Um, I think one of the wild cards, though, is this is the virus. Um, we and the economy, too. Um, the polling is really showing that um, people trust Biden on the virus. Um, and since it's not going away, uh, I just don't know how Donald Trump is going to get his arms wrapped around it because he just almost refuses to do that. Uh, Cam, let me get your thoughts, uh, because one of the things out there is like even though the polls show that uh, Joe Biden is actually ahead, uh, both national and state polling, you have a lot of folks who will say, well, there is a, the quote unquote, the silent majority that that's out there, like with, with sort of Richard Nixon back in 1968. And, and those folks don't get polled, but they're going to show up you know, to the polls in droves. And that's going to get Donald Trump back into victory. Well, I, I don't know uh, how uh, how majoritarian that silent majority is this go around. I think uh, from Nixon's days, we're a much more polarized uh, electorate uh, these days. And if, if you want to lose a campaign, run a, a campaign as if it's yours to lose. So Biden needs to run through the tape to overcome any stealth Trump voter. Um, and and I'm, I'm always suspect of polls this far out because anything can happen, uh, particularly in this uh, volatile climate with the economy, with uh, the pandemic, with a, vi a vaccine for the virus somewhere in the future that could be in the opportunity for the uh, classic October surprise, uh, whatever it may be, I, I think is out there. So it's a very volatile electorate. Polls at this stage, particularly of registered voters versus likely voters, uh, I remain suspect of. And uh, I do think the one clear dynamic is this election at a national level is going to be a referendum on the performance or non-performance of, of Donald Trump while in office. Uh, Lindsey Marie, let me get your thoughts in here because obviously, you know, with just Trump Biden, but there's also a libertarian candidate uh, for president as well. Uh, where do you see where do you see the national race going? Definitely. So we do have a third party candidate, and I would say she's the only one to vote for if you care about criminal justice reform issues. Um, a lot of people say that Biden is for them, but if we look at his record, I don't believe that whatsoever. I think his record speaks for itself. It wasn't just the crime bill. It was the Comprehensive Control Act. It was the civil asset forfeiture he expanded. It was the drug war. It was mandatory minimums. I mean, you name it, he did it. He wrote it and he passed it. The other issue, too, is he used to, I mean, it's not necessarily something that he potentially used to believe in and no longer does. This is a man who went on public television and was boasting about how many crimes that he passed that were now death penalty eligible. I don't see how you can smile through your teeth and say that kind of thing and now claim to be on the other side. 
And we start to look who at maybe the vice presidential candidate. And if it's Kamala Harris, I think he completely shoots himself in the foot in terms of getting anybody on board who truly wants to reform the system and see things better off. If you want to end qualified immunity, which he doesn't seem to want to do at this point, your votes for Joe Jorgensen, the libertarian candidate. You're watching Indiana Issues. I'm Abdul Hakim Shabazz, the editor and publisher of Indian Politics. And we're coming to you from the Edge Media Studios in downtown Indianapolis. We're talking with a less than 100 days to go uh, before the election. So our panel today is Democrat Laura Beck, Republican Cam Carter, uh, WIBC and Network Indiana reporter uh, Berman, and uh, Lindsey Marie, uh, Libertarian. Uh, folks, let's change gears. Let's go to the uh, governor's race. Or or is there much of a governor's race uh, at all right now? Uh, the last couple of polls showed Eric Holcomb. With a 20 something odd point lead. He's got $8 million at the bank and some change. Uh, Laura, let's go ahead and start with you on this one, if we could. Yeah, I think Governor Holt's in a really strong position right now. Um, and uh, he also is the incumbent, he has a bully pulpit. Um, he uh, is, although, uh, leading the seat uh, at a time of great people with COVID. Um, and so while I think he has been steady, I think there have been some missteps. I mean, I think. Um, calling for a mask mandate and then uh, walking them back and saying, oh, you know, you, we're not really going to enforce it, but you need to wear it. Um, I, I think what we could potentially see between now and the election is if things go really south on COVID, uh, there could be some pushback to him. Um, well, he's been good at inoculating himself, and I think he's in a better position than other governors um, uh, who are Republican governors who are, are struggling right now. Um, the wild card is COVID. And when you look at uh, Dr. Myers, uh, he has that medical background and is the former state health commissioner and has some really great experience in that area. Uh, so it does remain to be seen. Um, but right now he is, uh, Governor Holcomb is certainly in the lead. Uh, Eric Berman, my friend, let me get your thoughts on this. Uh, obviously, the governor is in the lead, but uh, what about COVID-19 and how that could, could impact uh, the governor's race? Because obviously the governor's gotten some pushback from some of the more far ideological right members of his party. Yeah, I, I don't think that that's enough to uh, to put him in any kind of electoral trouble. That's just not that big a slice of the party. Polls consistently show people support what he's done, support the idea of masks. Um, the governor's on the right side of that issue. The problem is, again, it's a long way to the election, and, and Laura hit it on the head. We don't know where this pandemic is going to go. Um if the governor turns into Ron DeSantis, where all of a sudden things take a bad turn for the worse and he's perceived as not having addressed it, that's the one that, the one thing that could uh, undo the track this race is on. Um, the problem that the Democrats have, Woody Myers still does not have much money to speak of. I think Christina Hale in a congressional district has twice what uh, a candidate for governor has in the war chest. And when you have that little ability to get your message out, that means the what he needs to hope for if he's going to pull the upset is that people are so mad at Governor Holcomb that they're going to vote for whoever the other name on the ballot is. And at the moment, that's not happening. But we've got uh, three months of uh, a lot of twists and turns flying ahead. Uh, Lindsay Marie, let me get your thoughts on this, uh, because obviously uh, Libertarians have Don Rainwater as their candidate uh, for governor. Uh, but is this race Holcomb's to lose? I still think it is Holcomb's to lose. Um, I don't think he's done anything as egregious as Mike Pence did during his time in office. So I think there's not as much hatred and just anger towards him. And I'll say it again. I don't think the Democrats hate him as much as Rob Kendall does, which is a testament to sort of where their rallying base is at this point. Um, you know, with, with Rainwater, um, it, he is the other name on the ballot. He's the only one that's calling for more limited government who is actually pledged to do that and who isn't for certain things that Holcomb has done. It basically looks like you have two Democrats running against a libertarian. I think he's very good positioned to get that vote if you're very angry with Holcomb right now. Um, but I don't think statistically, unfortunately, that this is going to be the year that a libertarian would win the governor race. Uh, Cam Carter, uh, let me get your thoughts on uh, Governor Holcomb. Is this his race his to lose? And uh, is COVID-19 sort of that random X factor where that anything can happen? Yes, yes. And he's not going to lose. <laughs> I, I, I think Holcomb is in a commanding lead. I think he's shown good judgment, sober, steady leadership amidst this crisis. Many things, again, can happen within the next 90 days. But I, I can't imagine the Hoosier electorate thinking that he, he morphs suddenly from a sober, data-driven, calm presence uh, during the, the, uh, these past several months into, into a Ron DeSantis. That's just not who Eric Holcomb is. 
And uh, if we are talking about stealth voters at the national level, uh, Woody Myers is running a very stealthy campaign, so stealthy that I can't even perceive it. And I'm paying attention to these things. He really has got to get in gear ASAP if he's even to have a chance. And I don't think he has much of one at this point. Uh, let's change gears Ab a little bit. Abdul? Yes. Abdul, yeah. can I say one thing? Sure. I'm sorry to interrupt you. You, you would expect nothing less. <laughs> um, I, <laughs> but um, as I was listening to Cam and Eric and Lindsay talk, I, I, what will really be fascinating is Hoosiers are notorious sl split ticket voters. So um, if you think about how we're going to be voting and if we're going to be in person, if we're going to be doing it by mail, uh, will people be um, just filling in the R box, filling in the D box, or are they going to go one by one by one and vote? Uh, we traditionally do that. So it'll be really interesting to see this election. And then you bring up an interesting point on uh, split ticket voting because I want to talk to you about uh, Todd Rakita versus Jonathan Weinzap on the race uh, for attorney general. And L Lindsay, I want to start with you, uh, particularly now Mr. Weinzapple is from your neck of the woods down there uh, in Evansville, in Vigo County. Uh, is this a race that Democrats can win? I don't know. It's going to be interesting. Um, you know, with how contentious the Republican caucus was. Um, I don't know that Rakita's gotten out there and done a lot of campaigning. Quite frankly, I haven't really seen much from him or Weinzapple. I did get a text somehow from Weinzapple's campaign, so I'm not sure why I'm on that list. But um, their campaign styles and what they're running on seem to be completely different. Um, I think there's actually going to be a lot of straight ticket voting. Certain counties have really high percentages in that rate, that aspect. And I think in that case, it's going to go to Rakita um, and more favorable than it will be to the Democrat candidate. Uh, Eric, let me get your thoughts. Uh, Todd Rakita uh, obviously beat uh, the incumbent, uh, Curtis Hill. Uh, there, there's a little bit of bad blood in there, but is that enough to, to sort of change the dynamics of this race? Well, if you're Jonathan Weinzeppel, you like the idea that there's bad blood there. Anything that uh, gets Republicans to stay home or even cross over uh, is good for his campaign. There were, would probably have been a lot more crossovers if uh, Curtis Hill had been renominated, honestly, you had uh, a big chunk of people on the final ballot at the convention. And again, this is a small sample size of dedicated Republicans at that. But you had uh, something like 60 people who got down to the final ballot and said, I can't support either of these guys. Um, that's what Jonathan Weinzeppel has to bank on. But uh, I, I'm sure that uh, at Democratic headquarters, they liked the looks of this race before the convention better than they like it at this point. Uh, Cam, let me get your thoughts. Uh, Rokita versus Weinzapple. Uh, does Weinzapple have a shot? I think he does. I think it's a, it's a small one. I think Indiana is still a red state. Um, I think a, a lot of people have underestimated uh, Todd Rokita, perhaps even in this bid at, at the convention, but over the course of his political career. And that has typically turned out to be a bad bet. Uh, but I think Weinzapple is the strongest candidate the Democrats have. He's got money. Uh, he's got experience. Uh, but he doesn't have uh, statewide name recognition, um, it, nor, do, nor is he running in a, in a blue state. So uh, I think the, uh, the odds favor Rokita, but they may narrow. Uh, Laura, let me get your thoughts. Uh, Todd Rokita, Jonathan Weinzapple, uh, does Weinzapple have a shot? Or is Indiana, like Gam said, uh, still red enough to uh, guarantee uh, Rokita victory? Well, I think if there's one person who has taught us that the role of attorney general is incredibly important, it's Curtis Hill. Um, and so we're seeing a uh, really significant um, amount of attention on this race. Uh, Cam's right. I mean, you can't underestimate Rakita. Uh, that is absolutely accurate. But he's also right that Jonathan Weinzapple has a great record. Um, he's raising money. Um, and he, I think, does really well with um, suburban women who are really going to be uh, a critical voting block this cycle. Uh, at the same time, uh, Todd Rakita, though, is notoriously prone to gaffes, um, and he's a little short-tempered. Um, and so when you compare those two candidates, um, I think we're going to see a little bit of back and forth. And um, at the end of the day, I think, I, I think Jonathan has a, a very good shot um, at, uh, at taking this race. No, Todd Rakita is not short tempered at all. Laura, I don't know where you get that from. <laughs> I'm just throwing, just, throwing, just throwing that out there. Uh, Probably, uh, don't at me, Todd Rakita. Don't at me, please. <laughs> uh, before we get ready to take our break here, I want to uh, focus on uh, perhaps one of, the most, one of the most important races in Indiana, also in the country. Uh, Christina Hale versus Victoria Sparks in the 5th Congressional District. That race, uh, Susan Brooks obviously not running for re election. Uh, uh, Cam, let's start with you. Uh, how do you see that shaping out, at least right now? Well, I think if uh, there's a blue wave and it hits Indiana, 
it's going to hit the fifth district and you'll have U.S. Representative Christina Hale. If it doesn't, if Republicans come home, if they see something they like in State Senator Victoria Sparks, then, then I, you know, the district was <laughs> designed to be a Republican district. Uh, but its its hue has been changing from a, a red district to lighter red to purplish. Uh, and I think this is a true bellwether. I think that's why, it, including the uh, dynamism of, of Christina Hale herself and her service and um, strong campaign uh, skills, that you're seeing money come in and you're seeing the national Democrats target this. And I'd, I'd make it a jump ball at this at this point. Uh, let's let me get your thoughts. Is it a jump ball or uh, is it actually a chance of blue wave? If it does hit, uh, the 5th District will be the place where it goes. I don't know. I'm not really going to make a call on this one. It's too close, I think. Um, I still, part of me thinks that we're not at a place in that district where you're going to flip it. I think you're get, you've gotten closer over time. I just don't think it's there. The tipping point, I don't think, is going to be this election. And I still think, based on so many people voting straight tickets, um, I don't know that's going to flip that easily. Uh, Mr. Berman, let me get your thoughts. Uh, is this obviously this is one of the most contested races uh, in the country? Is it jump ball or do Democrats have a have a good shot at uh, capturing the fifth? It's a jump ball, which means, yes, Democrats have a good shot <laughs> capturing it. I mean, we, we've talked about this on the program before. The, the you all, all you have to do is look at the 2019 elections where uh, the Democrats picked up city council seats in Fishers first time ever, picked up seats in Carmel first time ever, picked up the mayor's seat in Zionsville. Zionsville hasn't had a mayor that long, but still first time ever. All those suburban areas that people have been watching nationally started shifting blue last year, and that shift's only going to be bigger in 2020. But Bill Weld got 13% of the vote in Hamilton County. That's another good sign for Christina Hale and a danger sign for the Republicans. The problem for Christina Hale and the advantage for Senator Sparks is the district extends a lot further north than that. Madison County still votes and Tipton and Howard and all, all those other counties, which went for Susan Brooks by something like 68%. And so it it's your classic upstate, downstate kind of situation. Can Christina Hale run up the score enough at the southern end of the district to offset uh, Victoria Sparts on the north end? Uh, Laura, I'll give you the last word before we take our quick break here. Uh, your thoughts on the fifth. Well, you know exactly what I'm going to say. So, I mean, it's going to be pretty basic. Um, I, 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 this is really going to be, uh, if anyone's going to take this district, it's going to be Christina Hale. Um, this is a nationally targeted race. Um, she has raised, um, I don't want to say gobs of money, but she's raised a heck of a lot of money. Um, she also is running against someone who uh, has taught, has hitched her wagon to Donald Trump. Um, and, this is a trick that Joe Donnelly won in 2018. Um, and just think about what's happening in 2018, uh, if we can even think back that far. So I think it's, uh, I think Christina has really got a great opportunity to, to win this. Um, but again, I think it's going to be those uh, college educated women um, and even some men, uh, I think, who are, are going to be turning away from Donald Trump. COVID is going to have a big part on this too, because while in some of those districts, uh, we have in that district, maybe we haven't seen the spikes that we have in Marion County. Um, if we are continuing to lag behind and one of those areas becomes a hotspot, uh, there could be a lot of disillusionment with Donald Trump there too. Our guests today are Democrat Laura Beck, Republican Cam Carter, Eric Berman of 93 WIBC and Network Indiana, as well as our good friend Lindsay Marie, Libertarian. We're going to take ourselves a quick break. We'll come back. COVID-19 and the death of Joe Kernan, former governor of Indiana. You're watching Indiana Issues. Coming to you from the Edge Media Studios in downtown Indianapolis. We'll be right back.
And welcome back to Indiana Issues. I'm Abdul Hakim Shabazz, the editor and publisher of IndyPolitics.org. Well, COVID-19 has taken its toll on the state of Indiana, uh, basically freezing everything in place as Indiana uh, will be staying at stage 4.5 on the Governor Holcomb's back on track plan. Also, uh, with schools opening, as many schools opened up in a hybrid fashion. Uh, so, Laura, let's go ahead and start with you. Uh, how is Indiana dealing with COVID-19 right now? Muted. Sorry. Are you asking me because I'm getting ready to send my kid back to school on August 12th? <laughs> Is that why I get this question? That's why you get to guess why you move. That's what I'm going to do with you right there, right out of the gate. <laughs> well, um, I mean, I, I have to separate my my personal opinion from um, what I see going on. I mean, I think it's I think it's just absolutely top of mind for everybody. Um, and I think we are doing the best job we could do. Uh, but I also think that um, I, I just don't know if we can count on people to change their behavior. Um, unfortunately it's been politicized. Um, I think, uh, it's also the proof is in the pudding when kids start going back to school, frankly. Um, you already had at Greenfield, uh, where Greenfield central, where the middle school student on the uh, middle school student on the very first day tested positive. Um, the whole focus has been getting kids back to school so we can restart the economy. But what happens to a working parent when their kid is quarantined? Um, and then they have to quarantine, um, and then they got to get tests and then you're kind of on this rolling start and stop all the way through. Um, so I, I think the best intentions are there, uh, but I think it, it, it can get challenging. And, and as a parent, you do sometimes wonder, uh, why it seems like the state superintendent of education, who is a teacher, who was a teacher and a superintendent really is not getting a platform or an opportunity to talk about some of these issues. So, um, I, I, I'm trying to be cautiously optimistic, but um, I, I don't have a lot of great hope right now. Eric, let me get your thoughts on this uh, This part of the COVID-19 debate and discussion. Uh, the Democrats have been pushing once again uh, for no excuse absentee voting. Uh, they had a, a news conference of a couple of weeks ago saying they wanted a special session to do this. Uh, how does COVID-19 impact our elections this year? Well, it means a lot less, a lot less, it means virtually no door-to-door, -door, one -on one-on-one campaigning. Um, you know, the, both, that probably hits the attorney general's race, which you were talking about, about evenly. Those are two guys who were really good at, uh, at retail campaigning. Um, but you look at a race like the fifth, where Victoria Sparks is on a ballot for the first time. She never even was on a ballot for her state Senate seat. So the, her congressional primary was the first time. She's got to get out and introduce herself. And her ability to do that is severely curtailed. Christina Hale has at least a little bit of an advantage of having run statewide about a month, four years ago. And so some people may remember her from that, but it just completely changes the nature of the campaign. Uh, Lindsay, let me get your thoughts. Uh, how has COVID-19 impacted uh, outside of Indianapolis, say down in the Southern Indiana area where you are? Well, I don't think we've had nearly as many cases, but we do have a situation um, where the mayor did enact the mask mandate. Um, he's since put it to the wayside because now Governor Holcomb has his in place as well. Um, so I think in Evansville, you probably don't see the same precautions taken by a lot of people as you do in places outside of Indiana even. Um, but I think it's pretty much been business as usual for a lot of people once the governor finally did lift the mandate that closed pretty much everyone's business. Uh, Cam, let's talk about the mask mandate, if we could, because it turned out that the governor, you know, had the mask mandate, but then there was a question about fines and penalties. And then when he put out the executive order, those fines and penalties weren't there anymore. Uh, is, is that a, a foul play by the by the governor or just, you know, just doing this as we go along? I think it was an accommodation by Governor Holcomb to try to do the right thing, but also to try to honor the fierce independent spirit of, of Hoosiers. It was a retreat of some type, but he was having local officials, uh, none of whom uh, had MD or PhDs behind their name, but, you know, sheriffs in various counties saying they weren't going to enforce this. I don't think any of us want to see and probably would have rebelled had we seen it occur. You know, your, your mothers or your grandmothers or your, your fathers or your brothers uh, getting uh, ticketed or arrested or or somehow cited for, for for not wearing a mask. I think he was appealing to our, our better angels and and trying to put as much uh, force behind it as as possible. But COVID is on top of mind for everyone right now. If you're a small business person, if you're a parent sending children back to school, if you're a teacher or administrator going back into those school buildings and those classrooms. Heck, if you're just a consumer going to the grocery store or trying to, you know, uh, you know, 
in, enjoy a, a retail establishment. So we're going to be living through this. My greatest fear about its effect on the election is uh, long lines uh, and waits uh, on election day, a lot of mail-in and absentee balloting, and the complications that that come from those surges and and, and those um, those those choke points in our county by county electoral process. All right, uh, go ahead, Lindsay. I, I, one thing I just wanted to say too, with sort of the mask mandate and penalties, if you actually care about community safety, and that is what this is all about. You would never, ever institute someone going to jail for not wearing their mask because jail is one of the places where it's so easy to catch COVID. It's basically a Petri dish. You can't social distance. Most prisoners aren't given masks. They don't have the ability to easily wash their hands throughout the day, if maybe once or twice a day. Um, this is a situation where you would be sending somebody into basically a Petri dish for X amount of Oops, Lindsay, we lost you for a second there, but we'll uh, get you right back. I uh, want to change gears real quick. We've got just a few minutes left here. Uh, Joe Kernan, Indiana's 48th governor, passed away uh, this past week following a long illness. Uh, Laura, if we could, your thoughts quickly on former Governor Joe Kernan. Oh, thanks so much, Abdul. Um, there, it's been wonderful to read all the tributes to him. I had the extreme honor of working for Maggie uh, Kernan when she was first lady and then um, consider her a dear friend and um, I, uh, there's so much we could say. Um, and if you go to social media, you can read some just wonderful tributes, but, um, he was, he was a great American and he was a great person. Um, and I, uh, actually had the opportunity to see him in a little bit different way because I worked in their home. Um, and so there's a lot of stories that I can't tell. Um, but, uh, one of the things I can say is that they had what I would say is a marriage of equals. Um, they were, Two people, uh, Maggie definitely uh, and Joe together, um, they just in had just incredible love for each other. And uh, they never ended a phone call or a conversation without saying, I love you. And um, as we as we think about that and we think about how people, uh, th their lives and politics are defined by I'm this or I'm that or I'm this title, uh, that wasn't really how they defined themselves. Um, and they had, I think, this incredibly wonderful and full life before he became governor. And they had a wonderful and full life after he became, after he left office, because um, they were really good people who were confident in who they are and, and what they believed in. And, and he lived life every day um, to the fullest. And going to really miss them a lot. Well, I'm sure that's something that's shared by all of us here. Uh, we're near the end of our program. We're time for our predictions and prognostications, where we ask our panel to look into the crystal balls and the political ether and tell us what they expect us to see. Uh, so, Mr. Berman, we will start with you. You know, for about a year now, people have been looking at polls in Texas and uh, sort of saying, you know, that this this can't be right. The, the polls have been showing this race as close long before there was a pandemic. Te Texas is real. This is now a swing state. And of course, if that state uh, goes blue in November, um, that all but calls the election. Uh, Cam Carter, uh, your thoughts? Uh, what do you see in the crystal ball, my friend? Litigation. Uh, <laughs> I, um, I think we, I, I think I said last time we're in for a wild ride. Um, yep. Every week we, we see that. And I do, however, predict at this point in time that Donald Trump is not going to be reelected because he has not performed well in office. All right. Uh, Lindsay, Maria, hopefully we got you back. Your, your prediction and prognostication. Um, it's more just something I'm watching right now. It's a lawsuit filed against the state of Indiana, and it pertains to a law that says only local county election boards um, can request that polls stay open later. And the problem with that is it's made up of Democrats and Republicans. So like a normal libertarian who wants to keep the polls open later and challenges in court doesn't have the ability to do that. So this lawsuit actually was filed at the beginning of the month. So I'm interested to see sort of how this pans out. Uh, and Laura, give me the last word. I think we're going to expect to see um, some anxious parents, anxious kids. I think we're going to have some folks who are relieved, but I think watching um, schools, athletics, um, extracurricular activities, and uh, how that's all going to play out is going to really have an impact and could could put a lot more pressure on um, on parents and families, especially if uh, those additional um, uh, funds from the government are, are withheld. I think it's going to be a tough couple months for people moving ahead. 
All right. Well, our guests today have been our good friends, Laura Beck, also Kim Carter, Eric Berman, and Lindsay Reed. Thank you all very much for being with us. Also, thanks to our good friends here at Edge Media Studios in downtown Indianapolis for hosting us today. I'm Abdul Hakim Shabazz, the editor and publisher of IndianPolitics.org. You've been watching Indiana Issues. Thank you very much for being with us today, and we'll talk to you next time on Indiana Issues.